Hi everyone. Before we get into today's episode, we'd like to, as always, thank our executive producers, Tom McCool, Tony Chiron, Eustace Abel, and Jeremy Marcou for supporting the show. If you'd like to help out the show, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash historiesmost, or shoot us an email at histories.most at gmail.com with any comments or suggestions that you might have. And as well as that, Alex has an exciting announcement to make about an upcoming event that you may want to check out. Hello, everyone. I'm here to tell you that Intelligent Speech is back. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting the best independent educational content creators with their listeners. And apparently that includes me. Um, this year's conference takes place on the 24th of April at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, or that's 3 p.m. London Time. And I, uh, Alex Clifford, host of History's Most Podcast, I'm going to be appearing alongside the likes of David Crowther of the History of England, uh, Liz Covart of Ben Franklin's World, um, Rudyard Lynch of What is Alternative History, and around 40 other great content creators. There is going to be, well, 24 hours of content in four simultaneous streams so there is so much to discover and learn um it's your chance to interact with your favorite show hosts as well as obviously um fellow fans in an immersive conference experience each session will be on a different theme um around the idea of escape and i'm going to be um as well as um, being part of a panel discussion about the Spanish Civil War. I'm going to be doing a presentation about um, a great political escape where one of my favorite political figures from history manages to save his country, his career, and his bank balance from seemingly insurmountable odds in 1931. Um, tickets for Intelligent Speech Conference are $30, but if you use my special discount code WAR, you'll get a further 10% off. You can get tickets um, at www.intelligentspeechconference.com forward slash shop. So once again, if you use at the checkout the code WAR, you get 10% off, and also I get a kickback. So that would be a great way to support history's most. Thanks everyone and see you at Intelligent Speech. In this episode we return to our roots to discuss a man we featured in the very first episode of history's most. A man with so many twists and turns in his life. A man so interlinked with not just German history but world history as well that we needed to talk about him again and this time with an expert guiding us through the maze. From his successes and failures on the battlefield, through mental breakdown and then recovery, from supporting and being supported by the Nazis to distancing himself from the Nazis, and the invention of a political and religious conspiracy theory that spreads all the way from Germany to Kansas. Join us as we revisit Eric Ludendorff on this episode of History's Most. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and it's my pleasure to say that today we are joined by Jay Lockenau, historian and author of Dragon Slayer, the legend of Eric Ludendorff in the Weimar Republic and Third Reich. Thank you so much for joining us, Jay. My pleasure. Um, we are very excited to have Jay here on History's Most and to be covering this topic. It is, well, it's a topic close to our hearts on this podcast because our very, very, very first episode was about Eric Ludendorff. And, well, today you're going to get the real story because we're going to be talking to a real expert rather than um, just me and Peter wittering on. I think um, Eric Ludendorff is obviously a fascinating character and 
he's one that is surprisingly understudied, I would say, perhaps, in the English language, considering his influence. I mean, I think at the very start of your book, you, you say he's one of the most significant Germans, perhaps, of the 20th century. Um, why do you think that is, that he's, he's maybe not so studied in the English language? And in particular, I do want to ask as well, biographies that do exist of Ludendorff in English tend to either downplay or kind of dismiss or view almost as an aberration his life after 1918, which is the real focus of your book. Um, so why do you think that is as well? Well, that's a, several questions rolled into, into one there. Um, I guess probably the way to start this is to talk about how I came to the topic myself. Um, I was asked several years ago to write some encyclopedia articles for an encyclopedia of anti-Semitism on Eric Ludendorff, uh, his second wife, Matilda, and their publishing company. And as, even as an undergrad, I had written a paper, my senior thesis on Eric Ludendorff and the Supreme Command, his, his uh, career during World War I. And I felt like I knew quite a bit about that and could, could easily write a short piece. But I thought, why do, we, why do we need to know about his second wife? And why did he have a publishing company? I, I had no idea. And I think what, what has happened, in, and he is a, a much studied figure in terms of his role in the, in the German army during World War I, both as a, as a commander in the field during the first half of the war and then from this, uh, 1916 onward as kind of the brains of the third Supreme Command, Hindenburg and uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, the famous uh, team that led the German war effort, the German economy, the German media, they really had their hands in everything uh, after 1916 in particular. And but most stories of him then end with the end of the war. Um, he flees to Sweden. They, they sometimes they'll, they'll mention that he briefly flirts with Hitler in the early 20s, um, but he's supposed to have had a nervous breakdown in the summer of 1918. And that's a subject that I broached in the book without really resolving it. It's clear that something happened in the summer. He had some sort of a personal crisis, um, probably due to overwork. Uh, just his, his uh, work habits were legendary. He'd stay up all night and um, he was found um, you know, you know, undergoing fits of crying and couldn't sleep. And there was clearly something going on. He was treated by a psychologist who I thought this was kind of amusing, told him to um, get more rest and to spend time looking at mountains. Which I thought, oh, that sounds like a prescription I could get behind. And, um, certainly couldn't have done any harm. Um, but most people who were around Ludendorff at the time described him as very quickly recovering. Clearly his, his, his work level didn't diminish in any meaningful way uh, towards the end of the war. Um, so I, I began to see that as kind of a cop-out, um, a way of sort of ignoring this very complicated second phase of his, of his life after 1918. Um, and it is really a, a, almost an entirely separate story in some ways. It's a, um, it's a story that needs to be uh, told, even, even though we understand very well uh, what his activities were during the war. There was a recent uh, biography in German by Manfred Nebelin uh, uh, called Ludendorff, Dictator in the First World War, that is as far as I'm concerned, sort of definitive, but also into 1918. I was a little nervous when that book came out that maybe maybe Maybelline had picked up the, the story, but no, he stops in, stops in 1918 as well. And what I discovered in, in researching him was this fascinating, I mean, he, he's really the dominant figure on the radical right in politics through the early, the first half of the 1920s. Um, he's a kind of a mentor for Hitler, and I'm convinced, although I couldn't find any in paper trail, I'm convinced he's funneling money uh, from his industrialist friends to the to the Nazis and the other right wing right wing groups. So he's really uh, an important early supporter for not only Hitler but but Hitler in, in particular. Um, their ideas are very similar. And then when I was researching this in, encyclopedia article, I discovered that he actually Ludendorff actually becomes an anti Nazi. He has a break with Hitler in 1925 after the presidential campaign when he runs for president as a Nazi only gets 1% of the vote and kind of holds a grudge against Hitler for not supporting him sufficiently. Um, and uh, so he becomes an anti-Nazi and actually his, his publications are littered with, with satirical references, cartoons, making fun of the Nazis, um, charging that the Nazis are part of this massive conspiracy that he sees run by Jews and Catholics and Freemasons uh, to destroy Germany. So this notion that, that Hitler was part of a Jewish conspiracy to destroy Germany, I found to be part probably his most notable um, oddity after the war. Uh, but you, you miss all that if, and you miss 
his role in the Third Reich is fascinating, and we, we can get into that more as we as we progress chronologically. But um, he's basically untouchable. He's a, such a famous war hero and so closely associated with the Nazis. Um, many Nazis still respect him, even if they can't really stand to be around him. Uh, Himmler is kind of a fan, so um, he's untouchable as as a resistance figure of sorts, right? Um, Kind of put that in, in quotation marks because it, he's um, the ideas are very similar. Uh, Anti Semitism being very prominent in Ludwig's uh, philosophy as well. So that got me interested um, that that story and, and the, the role that his second wife plays, her, her ideology. He's essentially a character. I, it took me a long time to write this book, and I, and I justify that by saying that he's, um, he's not only an important military figure, and I do cover that at least um, briefly in the book. Um, but he's a political figure and a, a religious figure of sorts. He, he fancies himself a prophet. So it's almost like trying to write a biography of, of George Washington, if Washington had also founded a religion, uh, because it, just to throw something else into the mix of, of a, a prominent figure like that. So not, a, not an easy job. I can well, um, well understand that, yeah. And um, as you've kind of said, there's some really kind of fascinating diverse and kind of um surprising twists to this story um let's start actually with 1918 um and like you say um pretty much everyone who writes about ludendorff says that in 1918 the second half of the year some sort of nervous breakdown mental collapse whatever and then there's a you know, an implication, I would say, in most of the things I've read, that he's never quite the same again, that somehow mentally Ludendorff is gone, and that is the explanation for what comes next, which is um, confused and confusing in many ways. Could we just, uh, for a moment, then think about this kind of mental health angle? I think you say something along the lines of that whatever... You know, we can't diagnose and whatever happened, it's actually kind of irrelevant to studying his his impact. Yeah, I mean, so I, I make two kind of related points. Irrelevant is, is correct in one sense in that, I mean, Adolf Hitler had some kind of mental illness. Again, I'm not qualified to diagnose, but uh, there was something wrong with that guy, right? <laughs> and yet we don't use that as a justification to ignore him, obviously. Um, he's an incredibly important figure nevertheless had some strange ideas. Um, Ludendorff develops some very curious ideas um, in terms of his personality. He's extraordinarily dogmatic, um, fixated on his honor. And so he becomes very difficult to be around. Um, he's very, uh, it's kind of his way to the highway, as we, as we said. He's, um, he refuses to allow his associates to belong to any other organizations eventually. He, um, when he is running his own Tannenberg League in, in the late 20s and 30s, um, it is forbidden, it's grounds for expulsion from the group if you write directly to Eric or his wife, Matilda. You have to go through intermediaries to reach them. So there are some, there are some curi curiosities about his personality that partly explain, I think, his ultimate failure as a politician. That the, he's, he's not at all flexible. <laughs> so he ends up alienating everyone who's around him in, in the end. Um, whether that's reflective of a mental illness or something that happened, I mean, in some ways you can see elements of that throughout his whole life. He, in his own autobiographies, he describes his childhood and kind of behind the, if you read between the lines, you get that he wasn't a very popular person. He enjoyed being a leader. He enjoyed telling other people what to do. And you can imagine that doesn't make you very popular. So um, whether that is something that changes in 1918 or not, I can't really say, but we should at least um, pay attention. And the second point that I make is that if anything, it, whatever episode happened in, the, in that year, it kind of energized him in a way. It gave him a mission, a calling, uh, uh, something to do for the rest of his life with, en with enormous energy. I mean, it doesn't fit our usual picture of someone who's incapacitated by mental illness uh, to, to write a 500 page memoir in, from memory in three, three months. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. His, 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 um, his um, productivity, just in terms of his authorship of, of newspaper articles. And, and, and also one other person who studied the movement makes the point that they cashed in on this, on this idea and on his fame and, 
and stab in the back and all those things. And there's a certain cleverness that it takes to be able to, to manage that, to manage that image and that myth in such a way as to cash in. So, you know, again, I, I kind of try to put it aside. I say, sure, let's say he, he, he lost it briefly in the summer of 1918. But look what happens after that and, and what he does and what effect he has and who he, who he influences and how he shapes Weimar political culture. And that's really the, you know, I don't want to give away the punchline of the book, but the argument is essentially that he's, he creates this, not, not alone, of course, but he creates this language of victimization and revenge that, um, that carries him through the, through the rest of his life. Um, and I think it kind of infects German political culture with this, it you know, makes them susceptible to the calls of people like Hitler for a renewed war and, and with vengeance for this unjust um, defeat in 1918. I think if we, yeah, if we can't pin down his mental state, and I think you've made some really interesting points there. Um, you know, I'd never thought about the, the comparison with Hitler, for instance, um, but it, it's absolutely true. One thing that you can maybe trace with his character um, and with his his career um, from 1918 onwards, is that, and I guess it is a is a issue of interpretation here, but he always is very keen to protect. Either you could see it as maybe protect his honor and integrity, or redirect responsibility, perhaps, in everything that he does. Almost, you know, whether it's obviously the Great War and the collapse of what, you know, can hardly be anything other than his life work in the defeat of Germany in 1918. Also, though, through to the pot plots that he's involved in, where he comes up with very elaborate and unlikely stories for why he wasn't, in fact, the mastermind behind them. So do you think this is a man very concerned with, you know, outward appearances of, you know, German, Prussian honour? Or is there something going on you know, is he just desperate to avoid blame and he's so kind of vain and proud? I probably both. I mean, he comes from this environment, um, the, the Prussian officer corps that is imbued with this intense sense of personal honor that needed to be defended. Um, and he's constantly involved in lawsuits and, um, and you know, uh, military courts of honor, um, defending his honor against um, supposed attacks from Ruprecht of Bavaria, among other people. Um, so clearly it's, it's partly his environment, um, but it's partly also his, you know, it's, it's a deep rooted part of his own personality. He, um, we'll, we'll talk more about this later, I assume too, but the, the notion of Siegfried of the, the, uh, the legend that he began, kind of associates himself with, um, if you know the story from the ring of the Nibelungen, Siegfried is a prince, he's the son of a king, but he refuses to have, you know, his, his, um, kingdom just sort of given to him he insists on going out and making his own way in the world and he learns to become a blacksmith and he forges his own sword and he does all these things and he's intensely proud of him doing it on his own he's not relying on his father's on his father's name and just this inheritance and of course Ludendorff is not an aristocrat um, despite the fact that you'll see him referred to as Eric von Ludendorff all over the place um, he's not an aristocrat but he's from a middle-class background his family was, was in uh, some mercantile business um, and uh so he was intensely proud, and that comes through in his writing as well, of not being an aristocrat, of making it in this army that was absolutely dominated, although, you know, increasing share of middle-class officers in the corps as a whole, but leadership positions were practically monopolized by, um, by aristocrats. And so he, you, could only, you could hear that coming through quite often in his interactions with people, in his, in his um, self-defenses, that you know, he, none of this had been handed to him, and it hadn't been easy for him. Every bit, for every bit of it. It is interesting, you know, and inevitably you kind of compare him to Hindenburg because of, you know, their careers are so intertwined, but there is an almost, um, you know, old money, new money to use a, you know, popular thing between the two of them. Of Hindenburg's got two names, right? He's, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the second one now. But... Eckendorf, yeah. Uh, then it... But, well, Benek and then Dorf, was not it? Yeah, well, it's <laughs> difficult to pronounce in English. <laughs> so that was, again, that, you know, and that's, that whole story, too, you know, the notion of the Third Supreme Command being this team, um, you know, the sense certainly that you get from Ludendorff and those around him, and, and I think there's some truth to it, is that um, 
Ludendorff was really intended to run the show. Um, he and and that, but he was not senior enough and didn't have the aristocratic name to actually hold the command. So that Hindenburg was in was in command, uh, while Ludendorff was, was the brains of the operation. I have a quote from H. L. Mencken at the beginning of the book where he, he talks about his time as a correspondent in Berlin and learning about Luden, this character Ludendorff. He never really heard about him, but he was into everything. He was, uh, he was the had the world by the ear, one could say. Um, and uh, and one other thing, one other theme in Ludendorff's sort of post-war writing is the story of his being called uh, to the East to, to rescue the situation at Tannenberg in August of 1914. He makes a point almost every time it comes up of mentioning that he gets his telegraph telegram before Hindenburg gets his. So in other words, they're, they, they invite Ludendorff first, and then once he's on board, they, they bring Hindenburg along. Um, so he's uh, he's very he's got a uh, he, he's got an enor enormous capacity for detail, um, and which is probably one of his problems. But uh, he pays attention to those kinds of things. And I also think even you can see it in the post-war. Obviously, they have quite different lives after the war. But you know, Hindenburg is is practically royal. You know, he's so regal, so paternal, so kind of he's patrician almost in his in his conduct you know he's always above the fray as Ludendorff is much more um I don't know down in the trenches politically speaking rather than um physically in terms of you know well, yes and no as you said he he's careful um to to kind of what's it what's it called uh, to have an, an alibi so so to speak uh, and he certainly tries to avoid any association with the cop coach even though he's intimately involved uh, in that uh, and because partly because I think it failed, and so and it failed kind of ignominiously. So he's um, he's eager to disassociate himself from that, and ultimately, ultimately from Hitler. You know, he at the trial he has an interest in avoiding much responsibility for what actually happened. But he's he's sort of the motive behind the, the march, for example, uh, and uh, plays a plays a very important role in that, in that operation as well. And I'll say there was one other thing I was going to say about. Um, Avoiding responsibility, I think absolutely that's a, that's both a personal and a national mission to avoid responsibility for the lost war, to avoid responsibility for starting the war. You know that's a that's a, a very personal matter for him. Obviously, and I think he dives into these some of these conspiracies and and is, has so much energy uh, to write because of a deep personal need to to uh, tell the story differently, to tell his version of the story. Let's. Um pivot for a moment to something you mentioned before um the german kind of mythical figure of siegfried um who you argue that ludendorff very much identifies himself with to some extent um who is famous um for being stabbed in the back um betrayed um and i always think it's a bit of an irony that what is in english called the hindenburg line um the key fortifications on the Western Front, the Germans call the Siegfried Line, which is kind of setting themselves up for a fail. Um, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't end well for Siegfried. I always thought that was kind of curious too. Um, but yeah. yes, how much of a role, I think, you know, you argue it's quite a big role in the way he sees himself and um, portrays himself as well, Ludendorff, as this tragic hero. And it gave me a great title for the book uh, too, because that's part of the Siegfried story. And as a someone who played Dungeons and Dragons as a kid, I'm, I'm just enormously proud of being able to write a book with that title. Um, so uh, it came, you know, I, I talk to my students sometimes about how, how when one writes history and you go in with a hypothesis and you, and you do your research, but you have to leave yourself open for that, for that moment when it kind of comes together for you. You have to do the work. It's not luck. It's not just pure inspiration. You're, it's you're in the process of doing work. You get, you start to begin to see how it's going to come together. And that happened to me. I was in the archive at the uh, University of Pennsylvania looking at the, the Nazi main party archive, which is a great resource. It's on a because partly because it's on microfilm and it's available everywhere. The Nazis thought that when they won the war, they were going to build a museum to the party. So they were assembling materials to for this museum. And we captured those materials and, and made them available. So it's a it's a great collection of kind of early paraphernalia relating to the Nazis, newspaper articles and correspondence and, and things like that. And uh, I, was, I was leaping through and there was the headline in a right-wing newspaper and it just hit me like a brick. I mean, literally, it was a physical sensation. And the, the headline read, Ludendorff ist unser Siegfried. Ludendorff is our Siegfried. 
And where the, where the work comes in is I had done enough research that I could at that moment, like bring together several of the things, the stab in the back. I was like, oh my gosh, that's where the stab in the back comes from. And then once you began looking, it's all over the place. His notion, um, in fact, his last testament to his followers, he's dying in 1937 in the hospital. He writes a, a last testament. And his, the last line is, is basically mirrors Siegfried's last words as he's bleeding to death in this glen, having been stabbed in the back. He says, he turns to his brother-in-law who's killed him and says, you know, if, if there's any noble, I'm paraphrasing, if there's anything noble left in your blood, um, please be loyal to my wife. And he uses this word like, and it's, it's Ludendorff uses this word, Scharen, Scharen euch um meine Frau. And Scharen is kind of an old fashioned massing together, uh, word for massing together. So it's, it's very close to Siegfried's last words. And that was not an accident. Um, when Matilda dies in 1966, uh, the reporter from Spiegel is covering the event, and the last words of the article uh, describe them carrying the coffin out of their, their villa in outside of Munich, past a, a painting of Siegfried slaying the dragon. And so it, it, it just came to me in that moment that, that there are so many similarities. The notion, the notion of stabbing back, the revenge motif, um, the the kind of ancient Germanness, like Siegfried is kind of the German um, Achilles, some, he sometimes described as that. It's this the Germanic epic poem that's um, kind of national foundational myth. It was taught in schools throughout the 19th century. Everyone would have been familiar with it. And part of what I struggled with in, in making that connection was Wagner. Like everybody knows Wagner and the, the ring cycle and all that, which is a very different story. It's based on many of the same stories. Uh, it, it's based among other things on the ring of the Nibelungs. Uh, this medieval epic poem, but it, it changes the story a lot. So it doesn't quite fit. And so when I would run this past people who were, who were experts on opera or something, they knew Wagner, they say, well, this doesn't make sense at all. It's not at all like Siegfried. I said, no, it's, it's the medieval epic poem. It's not, not Wagner necessarily. So I had to kind of struggle with that and really get to know the, the medieval poem so that I could, I could draw these out. And I, I, I struggled with the press a little bit to keep these in, but the, um, the little epigrams that begin each chapter kind of embody that connection between the Siegfried story. It's a, they begin with quotes from the, the poem and, and what's going on in Ludendorff's life. His, his, his role, his position as a self-made man, uh, his, uh, his, both his physical military prowess, and he's very, one of the reasons he emphasizes the Battle of the Edge so much is because it, he personally exhibits a great deal of bravery and initiative uh, in that battle, but also then his strategic insights that he supposedly wields at the, at the end of the war. Uh, so he, 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 all those things are part of the Siegfried story as well. So after um, the stab in the back, the betrayal, um, in many ways, the next few years after 1918, Ludendorff is focused on revenge um, in the sense of one way or another, overthrowing the Weimar Republic and, you know, the common tropes of the right at the time, the idea it's a traitorous regime um, that lacks legitimacy. And the first big attempt is uh, the 1920 cap putsch, which the funny thing about it is you can read many, you know, very good general histories of Weimar. And the bit about the cap putsch will almost never mention Eric Ludendorff. Um, in fact, um, it's only a, a school textbook, but a school textbook I've seen says that one of the reasons the putsch failed was that Ludendorff didn't support it. Um, and yet, as uh, you know, you say in your book, and as I think, you know, people who, who look into the story in depth realize, it's almost an unimaginable without Ludendorff, this putsch. I mean, yeah. he turns up on the morning of the putsch claiming to be on a morning walk yeah. and just run into the putsches, which I don't think we have to <laughs> subscribe to that view to, to, you know, come to the conclusion he's probably pretty important in all this. Sure, and one of the main military forces, uh, the pro-putsch military forces in town, the Earhart Brigade, this Freikorps unit that had been fighting in the east, um, is stationed outside his apartment, providing, you know, protecting him and you know, just so happens. And he's at, he, I mean, he's at, if you look at the documents, there have been a couple of good books that I cite um, that, that really uncover his role. He's at every major meeting. Um, he 
It's, it's people that had run the Fatherland Party for him during the war that begin what's called the Nationale Vereinigung, the, the National Union. That's the, the sort of the headquarters of the Cap Putsch. Um, that's where all those people come together, capitalists, um, all those people, and where the money comes from. So um, it's, it's undeniable that he was uh, part of the operation. And I think one of the reasons he, he's a little bit, one of the reasons he's behind the scenes and people can, can kind of tell the story without him is that I think his, his name was still a little too poisonous among the general population. Again, there were certainly people that lionize him as a national hero, of course. Um, but the left, you know, working class never, never warned the Ludendorff. Um, there was a sense, I think, that someone else needed to stand in, at least at the beginning, uh, just because the Ludendorff name aroused too many passions. Uh -huh. And it, yeah, and I think, in a way, also that ties into our earlier conversation about his kind of resentfulness and victim status. He really feels the criticism, I think, that comes his way in 1918 and 19, where he is a really unpopular figure. Um, and I think it, it, he can't not have noticed the, the fact that the Hindenburg worship is so yeah. pronounced, even after defeat. Yes, I mean, this is a, I had to, I had to cut some of this out because, you know, when you're, when you're doing research like this, you go down these rabbit holes and, and then you, and you start, uh, you know, figuring out, sorting out all these intricate details. And then you realize no one's really going to care. You know, only I care about this at this point. So, um, but he gets involved in this lawsuit. Well, I'm trying to think about how to tell the story efficiently. But anyway, he he concentrates on this one page of Hindenburg's uh, memoir, where at the Battle of Tannenberg he suggests that I think he even uses "we." Uh, Hindenburg does uses the 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 word "we" to describe a, a sense of not quite panic, but concern about the impending situation. You know, where's the first army? You know, what's what's happening with them? Um, and, uh, but Ludendorff, again, at every opportunity mentions the betrayal that that represented, but in, in, in no way had anyone lost their nerve and how dare Ludendorff or Hindenburg suggest this. The problem that he had, there's a great biography of Hindenburg that came out in about 2014, I think, with from Kuta. It's not translated in English, uh, sadly, but really, really explodes this notion of Hindenburg as this kind of, you know, uh, peaceful, quiet, unpretentious. And Hindenburg is out there managing his own mythology and, and, and pulling the levers uh, every chance he gets. And one of the things that he gets Ludendorff to do is to, um, is to approve his Hindenburg's memoirs. Hindenburg gets Ludendorff to kind of give the thumbs, of a, thumbs up on Hindenburg's memoir. So then when it, when it comes out and, and people begin to pick up on this and Ludendorff gets wind of this criticism, he can't then go back and say, you know, how dare he, he's already given his seal of approval to the memoir. And the other thing that, that um, this biography points out is that Hindenburg actually gets friends of his to approach Ludendorff when they see an early draft of his memoir to say, to take out some things that are critical of, of Hindenburg. So that then you've got this document from, from Ludendorff that's very, uh, very friendly to Hindenburg, this, the first the first memoir. He writes many, many memoirs after that. Uh, but he's always kind of hamstrung, and you can get a sense of his frustration that, again, the, the paternal, aristocratic, uh, uh, beloved Hindenburg, uh, he's, he's being outmaneuvered, basically, through memoirs. Yeah, I mean, um, whether or, you know, how highly you rate Hindenburg's military reputation, the one thing he was excellent at was PR. Um, and you see that when he moves into the presidential palace, he basically turns it into one big PR machine. Um, they, I mean, they, it's in um, Anna van der Goltz's study of Hindenburg, you know, the, the presidential palace, the civil servants are editing books about the First World War to make sure. It and that's not just Hindenburg, by the way. I mean, there's a, um, again, I'd have to look up the name Muller, I think was his name. Uh, He's the kind of the head of the Kriegsarchiv, the, the military archive, and he's he's managing lots of reputations. He's controlling who gets what access to what documents. Um, he's sending out he, he's he's sending out information about books that are being written um, to the people concerned, so that they can kind of vet them as they as they come forward. He's very friendly to the to the image of the officer corps and and Hindenburg especially, but Ludendorff gets a lot of help from them too. <laughs> 
Let's, um, I think you mentioned earlier about how, his, you know, some historians or biographers talk about, you know, a, a flirtation with the Nazis. I mean, that's, I would say, a very generous way of putting, a, way of putting it because Ludendorff becomes, um, in the early 1920s, once he's moved to Bavaria after the failure of the Cat Putsch and Bavaria, um, as we've talked about in the podcast before, is, you know, the center of kind of reactionary politics in the Weimar Republic, at least in the, the first half of the decade. He not just, you know, he's not just a kind of fellow traveler in the loose orbit of, you know, he's, he's a pretty central figure to the Nazis um, in the early 1920s. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the primary example being the beer hall putsch again wh why do you think there's this misconception the idea that he's somehow you know very loose this loose or flirtation with the nazis when in reality it's it's like i say it's, it's quite a close association over a number of years um how has that got into the psyche or the you know the history writing that it's he's somehow this peripheral figure who just you know, somehow, sometimes he's almost like, oh, he's just there for the ride at the, the beer hall putsch. He's just, oh, and the Nazis think, oh, should we get a leader along? They ring up Hindenburg, he comes along. You know, sorry, Ludendorff. Um, you know, th that's just not what happened. How has that come about, do you think? I, that's, a, that's a puzzling question. I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, I mean, eventually... Ludendorff and his followers do everything that they can to distance themselves from the Nazis. And certainly after the war, there's a, the, the epilogue of the book deals with the post-war career of Matilda, who lived, as I said, until 1966. And the, the group sort of continued, carries on. Um, they try to um, spread this notion that Ludendorff was in fact a, a resistance figure. Um, and that's, that's a whole other, maybe we should get to the chronology to get to that. But they, they spread these stories about Ludendorff as being the, the, the behind the idea of the 20th of July conspiracy to assassinate Hitler, for example, even though he's been dead for seven years. Um, it's uh, so partly they're telling that story themselves, partly certainly in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, Ludendorff was a vocal critic of, of the Nazis. So maybe some of the distance comes, but I don't get the sense that historians are reading that, they're, they're, that story is kind of unknown. So it's not that that's why they would be ignoring his role. I mean, I think partly just, it's, it's Hitler fascination could explain some of it, that the, the main character must be Hitler. Um, and I'd like to point out, I don't know if the picture made it into the book, I'll have to, I'll have to look again. You know, well, the picture of the trial, um, in 1924, when they're on trial, the, the defendants pose in front of the courthouse. There's a famous well-known photograph of, I think of the 14 or so defendants in front of the courthouse. And it's often cropped in such a way that Hindenburg, that Hitler and Ludendorff are standing next to each other. Right, so it's just the two of them to kind of make this association. Um, when in fact, if you look at the whole photograph, the person in the middle, the one with the fancy hat and the, all the medals and everything, that's Ludendorff. That's who they're taking the picture of. The other people are just around. Right, Hitler is just this sad guy in a trench coat off to the you know off to the side sort of. So I think partly the fascination with Hitler has taken over to the extent that other characters are are maybe pushed to the side. But as you say, from the from, I mean, certainly by 1922, the association with the Nazis is, is ongoing, regular. He never becomes a member of the party, but I think he probably would have seen that as somehow beneath him. He's the Feldherr by that point. He's the, the battle lord of the First World War, and Hitler's just a corporal. So um, he never joins the party, but they, they're going to all the same events. The German day that, that provides the cover for the book, um, they cropped it in such a way that you can't see all of the, the assembled crowd, but many of them have swastika armbands on. Um, that that's not a coincidence. Um, when Ludendorff gives a talk somewhere, um, Nazis are showing up. Uh, Hess comes quite a bit. Uh, what's his name? Um, a couple of other, you know, high, pretty high-ranking Nazis are, are regular attendees at Ludendorff events. So, yeah, the, again, he never becomes a part, the, a member of the party. And I never could find the paper trail that shows him providing financial support. But there's pretty good indications that he's using his industrial connections. Uh, to funnel money to right-wing groups, the Nazis among them, others as well, um, uh, during the first part of the 1920s. And of course, at the trial, 
hints at the, the trial that really launches Hitler's career. I mean, many, many scholars have made this uh, point about the, the role of the trial. Hitler aces it. I mean, Ayn's very sympathetic court. He, he and Ludendorff both are allowed to kind of go on and on and on, um, quite off top the topic of any questions that they're being that they're being asked. And it's that trial that makes Hitler a national name. Um, whereas Ludendorff kind of comes off as a little pathetic. If you read the transcript of, of the trial, his uh, his excuses are kind of sad, um, and he really does doesn't take the hero stance that you know, Hitler kind of adopts this heroic. Uh, stance that I'm I'm the true patriot. How could I commit treason? You know, if it's treason to love your country, blah, blah, you know, you go on and on like that. And Ludendorff is kind of downplaying his role and 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 uh, evading questions and things like that. He doesn't he doesn't kind of take one for the team and so looks like less of a figure. Of course, he's exonerated um, uh, because and the judge uses this as a terms like um, because his his loyalty to the fatherland is so obvious. That his motives can't be questioned. So, you know, commit treason, it's okay. You, you did it for love of the country. And then, as we know, Hitler gets a relative slap on the wrist, but uh, Ludendorff walks free. So, yeah. yeah, just on that point about being found innocent of treason because you love your country so much, which is an oxymoron. Um, uh, we, our last guest, um, Jack R. Scott is a PhD student studying um, patriotism in the Weimar Republic. Mm. And I think a big part of our conversation was about the whole, you know, Deutsch national culture is very right wing, but it's seen as politically neutral. It's seen as just being patriotic. Um, so although we look back on it as being, well, look at these, you know, Ludendorff, Hitler were so, you know, they, they are far right figures who are committing treason to many you know, even even the, I think the, the the power of Deutsch Nazi in our culture was that even to middle of the road Germans, doing things that you know we would consider horrific, right far right treasonous activities, they see as just pure national minded patriotism. Um, but that's a bit of an aside. Well, one of the things maybe we could add to this conversation is is the you know the place where the Nazis and Ludendorff overlap. Um, so prominently towards the end of his life is, the, is his anti-Semitism. And one of the, one of the things, again, I tried to do, I'm not sure how successfully in, in the book, is to trace the growth, the growth of, of his personal anti-Semitism. Because I think figuring out where that anti-Semitism comes from in Weimar Germany in general, why it explodes like it does after the war, um, it's, it's, a, it's a question that begs an answer. And certainly Ludendorff, it becomes a centerpiece of his philosophy. And it's tempting to read back into, um, into the war, for example, some evidence of his anti-Semitism. There's the, the notorious uh, Jew count, the Judensalung, where um, the war ministry uh, tries to take a census of, of Jewish service members and where they're serving. There's a charge among the anti-Semitic right that Jews are shirking frontline duty. And if they're serving at all, they're in weird areas and, and safe and so forth. And, the result, and, and so that, that, that it's happening right as Ludendorff is coming into the Third Supreme Command. So um, it can be associated with, with Ludendorff. One of his associates, uh, Bauer, it was a notorious anti Semite uh, well before the war and may have been behind that, um, that census. But in, it seems to me, in a way, that's not connected directly to Ludendorff anyway. Um, and certainly in his, in his 1919 memoir, there's, there's no evidence that I can find of, of even veiled anti-Semitism. Um, when he writes about Oberost a little bit, sometimes the, the, you know, the, the kind of anti-Eastern, anti-Polish, uh, anti-Baltic um, prejudice that, that is common to many Germans bleeds over into anti-Semitism. I think it's fair to say that. Um, but I'd say that really it's a product of the post-war period and, and perhaps association with the Nazis and, their, and again, their, their circle, their ideas. And that, that together with his personal desire for a scapegoat, as you mentioned before, to, for some, someone else to blame, fits very nicely then with the, the crowd that he's hanging out with, with his own personal needs. And, um, and then as he starts to put things together, as he does in his conspiracy theory, you know, other enemies start to start to pop up, but the Jews are always the Jews are always part of that. Yeah, I think I mean it's kind of I think when he moves to Munich and, and moves in these circles, which include the Nazis, you know, and I think I think you as you say you trace it in the book, it's kind of nineteen twenty one to 
where that anti-Semitism starts growing. And that's also when he comes into contact with Hitler, but not just Hitler, as you say. And it's it's almost like, you know, Munich, Bavaria at that time was kind of like a, a far-right echo chamber, isn't it? Where, mm-hmm. you know, in a way, they're kind of radicalizing each other by that kind of circle being in such close contact. And protected by the, by the Bavarian police, the Munich police at least, and the, and the government there, especially from Nietzsche then. So... Yeah, absolutely. Kind of operating in a, in a friendly environment as well. Um, I do want to just um, revisit briefly the, the beer hall putsch, actually, because one of the things that strikes me, and it would be interesting to know what you think, is that far from being the kind of passenger, um, to me, it seems like everyone else involved in the beer hall putsch has a massive amount of deference towards Ludendorff in every decision. Um, I know, you know, history's tried that I've, you know, maybe Kershaw's guilty of this without me wanting to cast any aspersions on Ian Kershaw. <laughs> um, but they're kind of uh, all the way hinting through how much Hitler is resenting Ludendorff and how Hitler, you know, oh, well, he's got to be here. But, but at the same time, Ludendorff's the one that persuades the Bavarian leadership to come on board, without which the coup fails that evening, uh, within a minute, Ludendorff's the one who decides then to faithfully release them, um, which destroys Because he believes in honor. Because he believes in, yeah. he has their word of honor. Ludendorff's then the one who decamps everyone to, is it the Bavarian War Ministry, where they all sit for six, eight hours waiting for, and nothing happens? And then Ludendorff's the one who decides, once they've gone back to the beer hall, we march. We're going to go into Munich to... Um, whip up the crowds and get a well he claims get a get a sense of the atmosphere but they go heavily armed so you feel like that's a slight defense after the point but is this not someone in the lead rather than someone who's a passive figurehead yes (laughs) i think so um yeah, I mean, and you'll find it in commentary about the, the failure of the putsch immediately after. There'll, there'll be p- people focus on Ludendorff's role, and they say, if only he'd shown up in uniform, then he could have rallied the troops and, you know, gotten, they wouldn't have fired on the crowd and, and so forth. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of focus, a lot of attention uh, on Ludendorff in the immediate aftermath. Of course, he's the star of the trial until, hit, until Hitler takes over, and Ludendorff ends up performing rather poorly. Um, it's the fact that Ludendorff is on trial that gets the national coverage uh, that then Hitler, Hitler was able to profit from uh, in, in making his own name. And how much of, I mean, if you read um, Goebbels in his diary, diary, it gushes, I mean, he's, he's like a, a, a puppy dog gushing about the first time he meets Ludendorff, this great man. Uh, and you find there's evidence of that all over the place where you say the deference that they, the reverence that they held for, for Ludendorff is, uh, was palpable. Hitler, Hitler, after the fact, again, claims to have m- known about Ludendorff's weaknesses and downplayed Ludendorff's role and so forth. So yeah, and but I think maybe some of that is a little bit of uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. A little bit. In hindsight, it looks this way. But I think uh, at the beginning, I think Hitler was as good a fan as anyone. And that's one of the things I, I referred to before. One of the things that protects him into the Third Reich um, is the fact that Himmler got to really, really respected the guy. He didn't want anything bad to happen to him. So he had a he had an associate in Berlin who um, had pretty easy access to Himmler. And whenever Ludendorff ran into a problem, if they were censoring him too much or opening his mail, he could he could grab Himmler's ear and sometimes, not always, but sometimes get it taken care of. I think as well, you get the well to go back to something we were saying at the very start where people who write about Ludendorff kind of 1918 is this kind of cutoff point, whether literally cutoff point with the biography you were talking about or, or more, you know, figuratively in that afterwards is kind of an aberration. You then have the beer hall putsch and the trial is then maybe seen as a, as a cutoff point. I mean, there's the famous story of him, you know, supposedly marching on while all the people around him are shot, which I personally wonder whether he didn't just go down, get back up. And then, especially as everyone seemed to have believed he was shot, it seems unlikely to me that he kept walking that's if everyone yeah, comes question. away the impression he was so dead. I have, him, I have him marching on, or at least I, I cite the people that were there that have him marching on. So mm. 
Um, in part because it fits with, I mean, again, it's a, it's a judgment call, um, but it fits with the story of Liege and that the parallel that he made, he draws as he continues to retell and retell and retell the story of the Battle of Liege is this sort of personal bravery under fire. Um, there, you know, and there's a sketch of him, you know, marching uh -huh, on this uh -huh. falling around him. But, so it's, it's one of these elements of the mythology of the man, isn't it? Um, and I think one of the, it's one of the English biographers, Goodspeed or Parkinson, says that he, he marched out of history at that moment. Yeah, right. And yet, and yet the subsequent two years, I would argue, is probably the most active of his political life. Um, the trial, like you say, it to some extent discredits him because his defense is more or less that he's a confused old man who didn't actually know what was happening when he went to the beer hall. Um, and he certainly comes out of it to some extent a diminished figure because of his, um, you know, I think people, he's only 58 at that point, and yet he's portrayed as this kind of old man who doesn't know what's going on. And yet the subsequent 12 months or so, he's engaged in, you know, what can only really be seen as a struggle to gain control of the Nazi party. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, Hitler famously takes this idea that he's, he's going to be, he's not going to judge any matters while he's in prison. He just sort of disappears for a while, ostentatiously refuses to, to make decisions. And uh, Ludendorff and a couple other folks try very uh, hard to take over the Nazi party to form something else out of it, perhaps in this uh, Deutsche National Volkspartei, uh, or not, no, the uh, Freiheitspartei. Right? Um, and and they fail, um, partly because of the loyalty to Hitler that so many Nazis have. Just whatever they might think about Ludendorff, their loyalty is to, is to Hitler, for many of them are the most important members of the party. Um, and then again, I think the ineptness of Ludendorff and these others, um, they're fractious, they, they they compete for power themselves. Ultimately, I think some of his, it's, it's a very politically active period, as you say, but I think it highlights some of his political liabilities. Um, you know, the fact that he doesn't really have, maybe you could say the same thing about the Nazis in some ways, but he doesn't have a clear political philosophy other than kind of nationalism. Some people still associate him with the monarchy or the restoration of the monarchy. I'm not sure he's still wedded to that idea um, by, the, by 1925. Um, so, he has a lot of liabilities that I think show up at that moment and, and facilitate the, the weak birth of the Nazis then afterwards as Hitler becomes clear that the Nazi party really is Hitler and not anybody else, not, not Ludendorff for sure. And yeah. he runs, as he said, he runs for the uh, presidency in 1925 when Friedrich Ebert dies and, and makes a pathetic show and uh, less than one, around 1% 1 of the vote. Um, and I think that points to both Hindenburg's popularity, um, Ludendorff's uh, unpopularity in many circles, and, uh, and then as Ludendorff sees it, a, a betrayal by Hitler to uh, refusal to support him uh, sufficiently. I think on the second ballot, if I'm not mistaken, Hitler actually calls on Nazis to support Hindenburg. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, I mean, in one way, this kind of political story is just one failure after the other. 1918, the big failure, and then it just keeps failing and almost failing upwards as well. Um, but, but Ludendorff then, you know, there's a clear, there's two sides to it, isn't it? Hitler really wants to get rid of Ludendorff by 1925, sees him as a liability. Um, and Ludendorff himself is, you know, clearly politically limited um, in skills and is beginning to drift away. And he does that a bit more decisively with the Tannenberg League, which is probably now time to bring in his second wife, Matilda, um, who is also a very important figure in this organization. Yeah. Um, could you explain a bit about her and her influence? Yeah, she's a fascinating character. Um, again, writing these encyclopedia articles really uh, opened my eyes to a figure I didn't really even know about. Um, she was a medical doctor. She, she studied psychiatry. She was one of the first um, uh, female medical doctors to graduate from a, a German university. Very, you know, not the first, but very early on. It was, wasn't common for a woman to be a doctor. Um, she wrote a, a couple influential books prior to her association with Ludendorff, 1919. She writes a, a book that I think is translated as Erotic Rebirth, 
Um, and again, their, their uh, blend of sort of psychology and gender studies and so forth, um, she kind of makes a name for herself. Began speaking in right-wing uh, circles after the war. That's how Ludendorff um, encounters her through, I think it's Rudolf Hess that introduces them. Uh, he meets her. Um, and at the same time, his divorce, his marriage to his first wife is dissolving. There's some suggestion his first wife was a, a morphine addict. Uh, and he filed for divorce in 1924. It wasn't, uh, didn't come through until 1926, I believe, at which point he married, uh, he married Matilda. There's st lots of stories that go around about her um, that she first tried to hit on Hitler to see if she could get in on the, you know, on the ground floor of that movement. And he rebuffed her. And she was obviously more successful with, um, with Eric. She was quite a bit younger than him, um, but that wasn't, wasn't uh, seen as much of an issue. And she introduces her, as her ideas develop, it really develops into a, 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 a religion, what she would call a kind of a rational religion. She's associated um, during her school days with a, it's escaping me, but uh, with the founder of Monism, this effort to kind of unify uh, science and religion. And she kind of takes that thread, I think, and then mixes in some of her own ideas to come up with this philosophy that she calls Deutsche Gotterkenntnis, or the Germanic understanding of God. So as Ludendorff founds the, the political group, the Tannenberg League, based on his name after his famous victory in 1914, um, to, to begin to try to replicate the success of the Nazis and ultimately fails. And we'll talk a little bit about who joins the Tannenberg League and so forth. At the same time, um, Matilda starts to collect followers, many of them overlapping with the Tannenberg League of this, of this religious philosophy of hers. And I, I devoted an enormous amount of energy early on to trying to really understand what this, what this philosophy was and uh, to just be able to describe it in some sort of coherent way. And I really, I really struggled with it. Um, the idea is basically that every race, and by race at the, that, that, that time, we're talking about the Germanic race and the, you know, the French race and the Latin race or something like that. Um, every race has a unique spirituality and that, that, that kind of an essence in, in themselves that is racially transferred by, by blood that is part of the racial inheritance. And that you can only be fulfilled. In some ways, it's kind of a, a new agey kind of self-fulfillment philosophy, also very anti-Semitic, so don't, don't think that I'm praising it somehow. But um, that if, if you can get in touch with that spirituality, you can lead a fulfilled life. And it's, it's um, so the, one of the key insights that she has is that Christianity as, a, as an alien religion, as a foreign religion founded in the Middle East by Jews, um, maybe we'll talk, we can talk more about some more philosophy about Christianity, is, a, is a, therefore an alien religion to Germans. And, and as a result, Germans are tortured on a daily basis, tormented psychologically, um, fooled into believing ridiculous things about um, virgin birth and heaven and hell, and, and forced to run their lives according to this wacky, uh, these wacky lies about magic. And so what we really need to do is have these discussion circles and order our lives as the ancient Germans did and our families and our political structure and, and get in touch with this Germanic spirituality. And that's kind of the happy version of the, of the story that they would then carry on after the war is saying, look, look we're not, we're not anti-Semitic. The Jews can have their religion too and, and flourish with it. And the Ameri you know, uh, the English, they can have their own spirituality and, and be, everyone can be happy and at peace. Um, but it's really in this kind of conspiratorial mindset uh, uh, that it becomes both anti-Christian and anti-Semitic in a, in a way that's linked, in, in, as might be obvious, in the fact that Christ was, was a Jew. Um, she goes so far as to claim, uh, unlike more mainstream, uh, say, the German Christians who try to do away with the Old Testament, for example, to come up with a kind of Christianity without, without the Jews, um, she actually ends up writing uh, that Christianity is, in fact, an invention of Jews uh, using uh, old Hindu texts. And she claimed to have seen these Hindu texts and to be one of the few people in the world who could read them and, and to find in them the, the foundations of the New Testament and, and all, of its, all of its lies. So she's both anti-Semitic and anti-Christian. And this... I think that's, and just yeah. to highlight that point, if it, if it isn't occurring to listeners already, one of the reasons for his lack of political clout in Germany is his 
fervent belief in the uh, in the words anti-Christian viewpoint. I know most Germans just won't have that. But Nazis were much more careful to tread lightly around the church, even though there were, were conflicts throughout the Fifth Reich, but um, they were much more careful and came to religion. And, and Ludendorff, just like he goes on a bit of a journey with anti-Semitism, he goes on a bit of a journey with this Deutsche Gotterkentnis, if I got that right, um, Matilda's religion. Um, because you see in the Putsch trial in 1924, he's hitting out of the Catholic Church. And Hitler, like we said, is very careful in that trial. He actually says he's a Catholic um, to distance himself from that. And he starts off with very much, you know, attacks on Catholics, which in a way fits nicely into the German nationalist um, stable from Bismarck's day. But that evolves by the about 1927. I'm not sure that's quite right. But, you know, that ballpark into him fully fledged signing up for this faith and therefore signing up to the view that Christianity as a whole is the problem and is is a is a well, he, he you might be able to date this a bit better, but he begin he basically sees the world as Moscow, Judah and Rome, the the conspiracies of Bolshevism, Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, <laughs> as, as the conspiratorial forces that are that are destroying Germany specifically, I believe. Yeah, and for all of his anti-Semitism, when you spend as much time as I did um, with his writings and, and his activities, he really spends, I'd say, more time focusing on the Catholic Church. And partly, I think that's a, a result of being in Bavaria for much of the time. Um, but he, his attacks on the Catholic Church are really open and violent and, um, and pronounced. There are a lot of the, not just Ludendorff's works, but works that come out of his publishing company, they often have you know covers with leering priests, you know, looking over German women and and things like that, and it's pretty graphic. Uh, and so, in some ways, I think it's just the enemy that's that's most in front of you or out in the open. And also, his Prussian background. Some people have pointed to the fact that he's, in his childhood in, in Prussia, he's kind of he comes from a kind of pro-Protestant background. Even for all that he becomes anti-Christian, his attacks really were focused. His anti-Christian attacks are really focused on the Catholic Church. Um, uh, but he does. He, so he, what, when his philosophy becomes full fledged, he sees three principal enemies. He calls them the the Überstaatliche Mächte, the supranational powers. And it's uh, I don't I don't see Moscow so much in that. He is certainly anti communist. Um, but it was um, Jews, Christians, primarily Catholics, and the Vatican, the Vatican as this conspiratorial network. And Freemasonry, and it occurred to me as I was reading, and then sometimes it kind of shows up in his writings and in correspondence with followers. A great, a tremendous amount of correspondence with his followers involved, you know, someone writing to him, "Did you know that so and so is a Freemason? Can you confirm whether X, Y, and Z is a member of this lodge?" You know, and um, so it, it, it's it's a kind of an interesting, and it's just in thinking about conspiracies in general, it's it's nicely airtight. In other words, if you're living in Bavaria, Catholics don't hide themselves. They're proud of being Catholic. They're easy to identify. So there you can, you know, that's one set of enemies that are that are there. Um, Jews, many Jews are 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 quite openly, you know, the Jewish community in Germany is quite prominent, and, and there are many many practicing Jews. And again, easy to identify. They'll sometimes fool around with names if they can't say for sure whether someone is Jewish. They'll look at the name, like you know, as people do, just try to decide whether the person is in fact Jewish. Um, but then adding the Freemasons to the mix is kind of perfect because if they're not Catholic and they're not recognizably Jewish, then they must be a Freemason. And that's a secret society, so they wouldn't tell you if they're a Freemason. So you kind of you could you could you could target anyone you wanted with that with that set pretty much in, in Germany. And of course, Hitler being Catholic was an important part of his anti-Nazi uh, campaign as well. That, that being raised Catholic, according to according to Matilda, and this really comes from the Deutsche Gotha Kentis part. Um, Traditional religions and Catholicism in particular um, essentially hypnotize children for life. And that once you've gone through this, you have to become free. And freedom was a big uh, motif in their writing. Ludendorff would sign all of his, all of his correspondence, Es lebe die Freiheit, you know, viva freedom, but long live freedom. Um, and so becoming free, becoming unbound was a, a term that they used a lot too to describe. Uh, releasing these chains of the traditional religions that have 
that have hypnotized you. And so for, for even just being raised as a Catholic, even if you grew up practicing, if you've gone to a Catholic school or something like that, you were kind of suspect because you had been subjected to this, um, to this process of brainwashing. So let's um, focus in then on these, these organizations and um, there's obviously his publishing house and there's the aforementioned Tannenberg League, which he sets up in 1925, I think. Um, at first, I believe there's quite an overlap between membership of the Tannenberg League and the Nazis, or, or at least, you know, people who are within the Nazi the orbit. Figures, yeah, a lot of the same figures show up in, in both. Eventually, it sort of sorts itself out, though, I would say. There are claims that the Tannenberg League at its height had over 100,000 members. Um, that's not insignificant. It's nothing that the Nazis eventually will, will claim, uh, but uh, that's a large that's a large organization. From what what I've seen, it tended to be former soldiers, overwhelmingly men, uh, and and former soldiers. And and it shows up again, especially in the light of the correspondence. The correspondence is very reverential. They'll often mention their service in the in the army, and the, that their attachment to Rudolf sort of comes from that. Um, so, and, and obviously it's a, it's a certain kind of, of veteran that, that joins the Tannenberg League. It seems to be kind of overwhelmingly veterans of the war, and they, and they cling to their loyalty to Ludendorff um, to the bitter end. The Deutsche Gotterkenntnis attacks, uh, attracts a slightly more diverse crowd. Um, Matilda's role is important. They play up the fact that she's a woman um, and pays attention to women's issues and has written about women's sexuality. Um, uh, that's a that's a big part of that. So it's much more attractive to women than the Canterbury uh, League is. Um, and again, it, it's hard to estimate the, the size of either one. There was significant overlap, especially at the beginning. Um, and and by the end, it, it almost becomes irrelevant. I I almost don't think about them as separate organizations anymore. They were technically there. They're both the A foul at the end, so they're they're, they're registered with the state as separate organizations. Uh, under the Nazis, the Deutsche Gotterkenntnis actually gets recognition as an official religion. So for tax purposes, you can sign yourself up as a, as a Ludendorffer. And uh, so, uh, but very hard, but it, it, people would join in ones and twos. I mean, literally you could see the cards that they would write in uh, to, to join the organization. It wasn't like masses, thousands of people uh, joining. And, and it took a lot of effort. It's a very part of, Part of its appeal, I think, was its exclusivity. Matilda, um, it's kind of weird to describe it this way, but when, and, I, and I'm not sure how she does it, but in her writings, you, she, it's almost like she's um, opening a curtain for, she's got her arm around you and she's leading you into this secret place. She often prefaces her books with, um, you know, people will, will think you're crazy for reading this kind of thing. And the fact that they think you're crazy is proof that we're right. Right, and 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 so it's almost like she she's got her arm around you as you're reading, and she's she's unlocking these secrets for you. And again, I, I I didn't I am not a, a follower, um, and it kind of creeped me out uh, that I felt that way. But um, she had this way of, of working with people, I think, that made them feel uh, kind of intimacy, a kind of involvement that that clearly some people responded to reading. Um, and as you've kind of alluded to there, by the late twenties, it's become a smaller and smaller circle, a smaller and smaller sect. And Ludendorff's days of, say, in the early twenties, of being kind of the figure of the far right in Germany is 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 over, and he's become, you know, even the Nazis won't touch him with a barge pole. And yet, somehow, this seems to almost be the kind of most not necessarily successful, but he seems to have found his niche. You know, he's he's kind of happy and he's got his band of followers who, you know, if, as I was saying earlier, he's kind of quite a vain, proud man, whatever. He quite likes having this small sect of absolute, you know, people who adore him. And he doesn't have to worry about the fractious kind of, you know, um, infighting of, of the far right. Mm -hmm. Um and, and that's when he begin. He also seems to produce so much of his writings as well. Do you think he's he's kind of found where he wants to be at last after 1918? I mean, Roger Chikrin kind of says after 19, he's on this great big psychological odyssey. Uh, 
to try and work out what he, you know, what's happened in his life and what's gone on. I don't know how much you agree with that, but has he kind of found it by the late twenties? He's where he wants well, to so be. Certainly, he's in he's in a rhythm. I'd say by the, by nineteen twenty eight, twenty nine, he's got he's got his own publishing house now. He used to rely on another publisher to to publish his works. Um, he fought with that person like he fights with everybody and ends up founding his own, um, and and also commercially profitable uh, publishing company. Uh, he was constantly berating his followers. His, the, the followers of Dutch Dutch Kempis were essentially book agents. Right? They were out there to sell the newspaper, to sell books, um, you know, and they would give them guidelines on when you're traveling on a train with someone, see if you can't, can't strike up a conversation about Deutsche Gartner Kentness. And maybe they had little little um, pocket-sized versions, abridged versions of some of the longer works that would be sort of introductory. Here, take a look at this. What do you think? And, and I'll write back to you and I'll, I'll write to you in a week and see what you thought about it. Or please send please send the book back to me with, with some thoughts. And then that would follow up with conversations and meetings. And, you know, never, you know, again, given the size of the organization, they didn't have these mass rallies, although they would have conferences periodically to discuss uh, Matilda's work at which Ludendorff would be present and praised and they'd sing, you know, his birthday was a big celebration. So I think you're right. He's, he's, he's got his people. He's got his rhythm. He's writing a ton, um, he writes a, you know, a weekly newspaper, a bi-monthly newspaper, a journal, you know, there's, there's just an enormous amount of um, produce coming out of there, both from Eric and Matilda, and then there's a team of other people that write for them, uh, that publish with the publishing company spreading this, this and use, and, and, and they're making money. I mean, he gets a, he gets a pension as a retired uh, general, but they have a really sweet house out in Twixing outside of Munich that uh, must have taken a lot to, to keep up. He, he lives he lives the life. So, um, and one of the things I struggled with in writing the, the book was this, because the, of the consensus that he's irrelevant, and including from, from uh, Chickering, with whom I, I, I had a brief conversation with about this, I felt compelled, and, and I'm afraid maybe I overstate the case of just because of the need to, to make it, um, uh, to, to point out his influence, his continuing influence, even as he personally and politically becomes in a way isolated, he remains relevant. He's still the person he is. People still read his books, especially so really well, because there are enough people that, and not just not just within that circle, but uh, you know, his his first memoir sold in millions and millions of copies, and he reissues that and he, he publishes other things that, that sell similarly as well. One of the things that I that I actually contradict Chickering on directly is this notion of the 1935 book Total War uh, having been read by no one. It was read by everybody. It's reviewed in you know, 17 different foreign languages, including it's reviewed in the United States, it's reviewed in Britain. It's full of his crazy conspiracy stuff, but people were still reading it to get some insights into how this, this strategic genius had operated and thinks future war uh, will be. Um, people on the, uh, Ludwig Beck read it. Uh, people on the general staff in the German army read it, reviewed. So, He's still, you know, people don't want to be around him, uh, except for his his tight followers. You know, the, the army doesn't really want to have much to do with him, um, but they still respect him. He's still part of the conversation. He's still the embodiment of of the, of the war. He is the war, he, and Hindenburg is also and and does things to manage his mythology, of course. But Ludendorff's the guy that was was in the trenches, you know, sweating over the maps and 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 things like that. So he's still. Part of the I just say that's probably the way to put it. Part of the conversation, even if he's not there, because nobody can stand it. Very few people can stand it. And I think the the even if he fades from view a little bit in the late twenties, unless you go digging in the archives like like I did, um, um, to the group, he's the fact that he's still part of the conversation is shown uh, in 1934 and five when the army tries to rehabilitate. Um, there's a whole series of visits, primarily by Ludwig Beck, but some other prominent officers that come along as well, pilgrimages almost to Tutsi, because Ludendorff wouldn't come visit you. You had to go uh, visit him uh, after Hindenburg's death. And um, they, they're trying to kind of resurrect Ludendorff, at least as a symbol of the old army. And because of his association with the Nazis, he might be able to provide a little bit of a shield. Um, you know, because he has some sympathy among certain prominent Nazis, he could maybe help to shield the army from Nazi influence. And I feel, I, you know, Ludwig Beck is an amazing, interesting character. 
Um, you know, he had the courage to participate in the 20th of July plot to assassinate Hitler, um, resigned, at, I think, admirably from the German army when it became clear that, that Hitler was planning uh, war of aggression. So there are many things to admire about him. And so I feel a certain sympathy, even if he's not perfect, I don't want to create the idea that he's a perfect human being, but um, I feel, feel sympathy for him and these, what these visits with Ludendorff must have been like. Um, they both described them as relatively cordial after the fact, but given the number of times he had to go back and the demands that Ludendorff was making, and then Beck, you can understand, had to explain these demands to Hitler, and that probably wasn't very pleasant either. And, um, and basically, he, Ludendorff was saying, and he said this to many other people as well, but in particular to Beck, uh, you know, this kind of, and this is where um, uh, Chickering gets this idea, I think, of the kind of the, the, the wounded lion. You know, he's a, I think it's Chickering that uses that, uh, that imagery for him. He's a, you know, well, look at you coming here now after all these years asking for my favors. You know, where were you in 1929 when this book came out that said that I lost my nerve? That, you know, where were you when these attacks on my honor took place? And where were you when this veterans group, you know, attacked my name? And, you know, and uh, it was just, it had to be uh, kind of unbearable, I think, to be, to be part of that. So what he wanted then in return is an end to censorship because the Nazis had begun censoring his works um, uh, into censorship and a, um, uh, positions for his followers, um, the ability to worship openly, it, 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 you know, practice Deutsche Gotterkenntnis in the army, some pr very practical things to, um, to ameliorate the condition of himself and his followers under the Nazis. And, and gradually he got what he wanted. Um, but it was a, a long time coming and took the intervention as a set of, of Himmler and Goebbels and Bormann got involved at one point and, and, uh, and Beck especially was interested in, in retrieving the image of Ludendorff, at least, if not his personal um, presence. And so he makes, by 1935, this is um, relatively successful. And so in the aftermath of the announcement of conscription and the Luftwaffe in, in March of 1935, um, newspapers seek out Hindenburg, or excuse me, seek out Ludendorff's thoughts on, you know, what do you think of this? And he says some very nice things about Hitler and, and how great it is to see the German army restored. And then he makes some sort of snide comment about how He's get, not getting enough respect that his followers are persecuted, but he, he has this um, really interesting relationship with the Nazis. But he, he does he does come back, so to speak, into public at that point. So I think even if he, as you said, to bring it full circle, if, he, if he's relatively personal, isolated, and, and isn't the mover and shaker he was in the first half of the 1920s, he's still part of the conversation. And you kind of alluded to a bit there his relationship in the 30s with the Nazis is unusual, isn't it? Um, because you're saying, you mentioned before how he was actually really quite critical of them as the agents of Catholicism in, you know, the late 20s and obviously the very early 30s before Hitler's seizure of power. Does, his, does he then have to alter his output and it's kind of semi-tolerated by the, by the regime, which is yeah, a so strange position? The Germans have this great term Narrenfreiheit. You know the you know the term Narrenfreiheit. The, it's the, the freedom of the jester, and so that's how I kind of think of him in the in the in the 1930s under the Third Reich. It's his position, and it, it goes like this. He's he's very critical. I mean, if you look at if you can see the images in the book, um, I've got a couple of covers. He wrote a book called Hitler's Verrat uh, on uh, Hitler's treason on the German people. Um, it was very obviously anti-Nazi. Um, cartoons that come out that show Nazis or Hitler as kind of dopes, as in the pocket of Jews, being, as I said, part of the, being manipulated by the Catholic Church. Um, very overt um, anti-Hitler, anti-Nazi rhetoric that you just wouldn't expect. That carries on into, I mean, I've got some examples as late as February and March of 1933. Um, but as you, as you could imagine, the, the extreme attacks uh, and and he is frequently censored. His books are frequently banned. His publications are, are, are confiscated uh, at various points. So uh, he does undergo some uh, some oppression. And, and yet, unlike most other vocal, open not critics of the Nazi, he is not forced into exile. He's not sent to a concentration camp. He's not, you know, he suffers no no penalties other than um, they do search his mail. They they probably tap his phone lines. Um, things like that. What the really interesting moment comes on the night of the long night, 
It's because for the first year and a half, his, he, he is under pressure from the Nazis. A lot of Nazis actually, I mentioned how much some Nazis really like him. A lot of Nazis really hate him. And especially at the lo local level, you've got lots of people that just hate Ludendorff. They, they harass his followers, they beat him up, they get them fired from their jobs. Uh, you know, they suffer all kinds of um, persecution from being followers of, of Ludendorff, especially at the local level. And so there's a sense in the, in the organization that this, this can't last, right? Something's going to happen. And when Night of the Long Knives happens and the purge of the SA happens and they murder, the Nazis murder Rome and other uh, members of the SA and, and General Schleicher and many other people, you know, any enemies that they could get their hands on, uh, Ludendorff was willing to sort of panic. The, like, oh, my, we're, who thought that this could happen? We're going to, we're next, we're done here. Um, and there's, except at the leadership, like you get the sense from the followers, the correspondence that I see from followers is very nervous. Ludendorff doesn't seem too bothered by it. He's, he's annoyed that his mail is being read, um, but he doesn't seem too bothered by it. And I found a letter in, uh, in the documents between this associate in Berlin and Ludendorff's kind of secretary, the guy who, who handled Ludendorff's correspondence, kind of took all the income mail. So there's a letter between the two. And the, the gentleman in Munich writes to the gentleman in Berlin saying, um, well, the, the, on, on like the, 2nd of July, I forget the exact date of the letter, but shortly after the Berlin Bridge, uh, he writes uh, to Berlin to say, well, those that um, the affair that we've been discussing has turned out nicer than we could have imagined. They finally took care of that old 175. 175 is a, a criminal code that, that uh, criminalized homosexual relations in Germany. So it was a slang term for, for gay person. So Ludendorff's leadership, at least, knew about the, the push, knew it was coming, had been corresponding about it in the days prior to the attack, and then kind of celebrated it after the fact because they were purging this, this um, immoral element from the Nazis. And we've been warning Hitler about it really all along. And that was okay. So it was just, that was kind of a find for me, I think. I don't know if it's historically significant, but I don't think anyone has, has realized the extent to which the, the planning had gotten out um, you know, for, the, for the, the purge, and that it included some people who were anti-Nazi, at least nominally, uh, like Ludendorff. That's really interesting, and um, I couldn't help be struck as well by the um, maybe even slightly ungrateful because Röhm was one of the few real Ludendorff devotees, at least in the early and mid twenties, who stuck by him when Hitler split with him. Um, but I don't really know by the 30s what his relationship was. But um, one, one final thing then is, is I wanted to ask was, and, and we've kind of mentioned it now and again, this life that the Ludendorff movement has after 1945, where it rebrands itself and it also kind of rebrands Ludendorff and, you know, reissues his works in a slightly different way. And in fact, the rather comically the Deutsche Gotter Erkenntnis still exists um has a website which has an English version as well you can go and read all their interesting ideas um they've got some views about coronavirus um but it's it's a fascinating kind of um afterward almost to or footnote to this Ludendorff story I, I did find I couldn't I couldn't find any more information other than a reference to a Ludendorff circle in Kansas somewhere in the 1950s, but um, I couldn't find any more evidence of that. But yeah, as you say, so uh, Matilda lived on, the, the organization really suffered after Ludendorff's death. They sort of lost the protection that they'd had against the Nazis. And so the persecution kind of kind of ticks up of the, of the group once Ludendorff is not around. He does get a, a tremendous state funeral and a, and a ceremonial burial, burial and Hitler and all the other uh, prominent party members are there. Um, he, uh, so he, he officially joins the Nazi pantheon, but I think everyone's kind of happy to see him gone, um, other, than his, other than his closest followers. Uh, sales begin to drop off of, of works. Obviously, he's not producing anything new. Um, you know, sales of his older works continue, but the group really starts to shrink and dwindle the loyalty that the people had felt in the Canonberg League was clearly to Ludendorff himself and not to this most for most of them not to this larger idea so it really shrinks down to be this Deutsche Welt Erkenntnis group 
Um, eventually, the Nazis cut off the paper supplies during the war, so they were not able to publish anymore after 1941. Um, one critic described that as the greatest thing that not Hitler ever did for the German people, <clears throat> was to, to shut Matilda up. Uh, after the war, though, she's actually exonerated by the Nazification Court as a resistance figure because she, she and her followers point out how anti-Nazi they had been. And, and convincingly enough, I guess, to bamboozle the court and get this the so-called Kazilschein, right? you know, the, the, she was one of the big guys. But she was such a notorious character and so overtly anti-Semitic that um, a um, man in Munich made it his life, basically, to expose her, wrote a book. Um, and uh, that got the court case reopened, and she was eventually uh, uh, classified as a fellow traveler, and she was banned from speaking and holding public office and be a teacher and so forth. So that really limited her, her capacity in some ways, but they just, they found other ways to get around it. Um, you couldn't, she couldn't speak, but you could cover her speeches in the newspaper. Um, so you could, she couldn't speak at an event, but she could record a speech and you could listen to. It. So there were all kind of these kind of loopholes in the, in the rules that she was able to use to get around to still get her voice out. She communicated personally with many of her followers. I mean, again, personally through mass newsletters and, and so forth, she made, tried to maintain this network. Uh, but one gets the sense that it really becomes the hardcore believers, the people that for whatever reason felt their loyalty to Matilda more than Eric that persist on uh, to her death in 1966. Um, there's an interesting constitutional part of the story too. So she, um, very litigious, litigious like, like Ludendorff had been in the 20s, the, the group sues everybody under the sun. Um, and so she, she claims that she's being denied her freedom of religion and freedom of speech. And so she sues on that ground and it goes back and forth in the courts over, over several years. And I think if I'm remembering the date correctly, 1972, finally, the constitutional court decides that, that her speech is protected by freedom of religion. She's, you know, recognizing that they're anti-Semitic, we just have to be very careful when it comes to, to uh, religion. She's dead by that point, but a minor victory, I guess, and posthumously. And that is... Um... There, well, there's an interesting, another interesting uh, part about that is the degrees oh. to which they, they change their story, right? They, um, they're not allowed to publish anything that is overtly anti-Semitic. So they begin, there's kind of a boilerplate introduction that many of the books that come out of the press have after 1945, which say, we're not attacking Jews in order to get around the, 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 the controls on, on uh, anti-Semitism. And say, we're not, we're not attacking Jews individually or Jews even as a people, but this organization, Yuda, which controls the world, right? That's what we're attacking is this conspiratorial organization not Jews or not Jewish people, but you know. So um, there's a, one, one thing I dwell on a little bit in the, in the book is a, is a particular publication uh, of the story of Siegfried, partly because that's my, my motif for my book, um, that comes out in the, in the 1950s um, that tells the Siegfried story as Arminius. In other words, that um, Ar the Arminius, the guy who defeated the Roman legions at the Battle of Toto de Laval, sometimes uh, known as Hermann, uh, that he was actually the, the historical basis for the Siegfried legend. And so it tells the story of, of Arminius, who, of course, his, his main enemy is Rome. So that's a way of talking about the Catholic Church again, even though Arminius obviously predates the church. It's a way of subtly in, in Ludendorff speak to, to bring up anti-Catholicism. And there are veiled, thinly veiled anti-Semitic references. There's a, a tribe of tradesmen that associates with the Romans and is only in it for the money and worships Mercury, the god of trade, and um, you know, it wouldn't take much, as I say in the book, for, for a devoted anti-Semite to read anti-Semitism into, into that. So uh, it would become careful, but you get into trouble periodically in other ways. I think it's interesting, isn't it, that to some extent, I think you can think the post-war rewritings by the Matilda Circle, I think has had some influence on the writings about Eric himself mm. ever since. Um, certainly in the way that they've been able to distance him from the Nazis to some extent. And of course, the, the famous, I think the most famous example is that telegram, right. um, which it's supposedly Ludendorff right. sends to Hindenburg when he appoints Hitler Chancellor saying, you've ruined Germany. This is going to be the doom of us all. Yeah. 
So that that so that's the first element of the story is that he warned Hindenburg about Hitler and that he would bring about a war. No one can find that telegram. It doesn't exist in Hindenburg's um, archives. It doesn't exist in the military archives. It doesn't exist in anything that Ludendorff's um, uh, given over to public scrutiny. So that the, the followers have given over to public scrutiny. So um, it's been pretty thoroughly uh, established, I think, that that never existed. That's apocryphal. It never existed. It was um, written about as though it existed in a in a, an esteemed publication from the 1950s that came out of the Institute for Zeitgeschichte, and that's sort of the basis for. I don't think the Ludendorffs uh, Ludendorffers had thought of it until that point, and then they picked up that that line. And then the second element, which is even more preposterous, is his involvement posthumously in the 1944 assassination attempt of Hitler. And the story there is that what Beck was doing in all these visits um, was not carrying messages from Hitler trying to rehabilitate Ludendorff, but seeking Ludendorff's advice about how to get rid of Hitler. And that, um, that Ludendorff has supposedly warned Beck that if Hitler ever got us into a war, that would be the time to, to get rid of him. So that's the, that to the Ludendorffers is the origin of the 12th of July conspiracy. I guess then your, the whole argument of your book, Dragon Slayer, is that Ludendorff's kind of been written off or underrated in terms of his significance in the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich. Um, and that rather than a kind of embarrassing footnote, this is a, actually a really interesting and influential figure in, um, in the period after 1918. So overall, you know, how would you sum up his influence after 1918? What is his significance as a, as a figure? Well, I think most, the most important thing is this, as I said at the outset, that he kind of sets the tone for a politics of, of grievance, victimization, and revenge. And he kind of em embodies that literally in, in the sense that, he, you know, he's not dressing up as Siegfried, but in the, in, as he tells this story with enormous energy throughout the 20s and 30s of, essentially his story and the Siegfried story, which is about betrayal and revenge. Um, he helps to keep that, you know, to give birth literally to the notion of the stab in the back, but then also to keep that language um, as part of the political culture of Weimar and, of the, and, and of the Reich in a really poisonous way. And I, and I hope I don't come off as, as saying he's the only one or the, you know, Hitler obviously is, <laughs> is a big part of this as well. But um, I, I say, I think in the introduction of the book that what I tried to do, again, with, with all due respect and without ever hoping to, to equal uh, Sir Ian Kershaw's work, I was sort of inspired by his, not his biography of Hitler, but his earlier book, The Hitler Myth, right? Which, is, which in a sense argues that the biography of Hitler is not all that important. What's important is the stories that people tell using Hitler and using his image that create political power. And so in a sense, I'm trying to write, I tried to write uh, the Ludendorff myth. And it's not so much about what he did and what was actually true about him. Um, so in terms of, that's the dodge I, I provide when we're talking about the Globus breakdown. Eh, you know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't need to necessarily decide that, but some people told the story that he did. He tried very hard to tell the story that he didn't and, and that story matters. So that's kind of the is the, the main idea. I hope that comes through. Well, um, Dragon Slayer by Jay Lockenauer has um, our warm um, approval and um, recommendation um, from History's Most. Um, like I say, he's a figure that's been mentioned a fair few times on this podcast, and it really is um, for after 1918, which in my opinion is, is the most fascinating part of his life, is, is the English language study. Um, so thank you so much, Jay, for giving us so much of your time and, and so much insight as well. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Peter. So a big thank you to Jay for being on the show. I've been Peter. And I've been Alex. And thanks for listening to History's Most. <laughs>
Zachary Davis, Jim Redfin, Benjamin Jacobs, I'm Eric Marcus, Dan McManamy, Brian I, Frey, Gregor Lynch, Susan Archer, Alex Clifford, BT Newberg, Raven Forrest, Chris Galto, Stephen Guerra, Earl Sign Chris, David Crowther, and I, Liz Covard, will be speaking alongside 40 other great content creators. This will be an event that you don't want to miss. Intelligent Speech is back. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting the best independent educational content creators with their listeners. This year's Intelligent Speech Conference will be held on Saturday, April 24th, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, or, for our friends across the Atlantic, 3 p.m. London Time. Tickets will be $30, but are available for only $20 as an early bird special. You can get them online at intelligentspeechconference.com shop.